Hello, my name is Orla Gray from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and the topic of today's presentation is statistical methods for managing bias in real-world evidence with a focus on propensity scores matching method. There are strengths and weaknesses associated with real-world evidence. Observational data can be used to compare treatments quickly and inexpensively. The data has more generalizability than the randomized control trial. Data collection can be over many years, much longer than the RCT. They can be used to answer questions that RCTs cannot. However, in real world evidence, treatment groups can vary in their baseline characteristics. Changes with time in the diagnostic criteria, missing information, and differences in follow-up can lead to potential bias. The concept of bias is often introduced as an obstacle to drawing valid conclusions from real-world studies. However, methodologies for the statistical analysis and critical appraisal of real-world evidence have developed considerably in the past 20 years and continue to evolve to address bias. These methods can address the lack of randomization of patients, which can result in lack of comparability between treatment groups and the presence of confounders. A confounder is an extraneous variable that correlates with both the treatment and the outcome. An example of a confounder is disease severity, which in clinical practice can influence both treatment assignment and the outcome of the treatment. Transparency and robust methodological reporting are critical for acceptance and accurate interpretation of real-world evidence. There are many potential sources of bias in real-world evidence. These sources have been well characterised in clinical and other fields of research. It is important to acknowledge that these biases are an integral part of real-world evidence. As our understanding of inherent bias has grown, so too are the number of strategies available to mitigate, adjust or correct for the influence of these different biases. Let's focus on one of the most important sources of bias, Indication bias. Indication bias is a form of selection bias for which the populations that are included in an analysis are prognostically different and therefore not comparable for treatment effectiveness. Indication bias occurs when the risk of an adverse event is related to the indication for a treatment but not the use of the treatment itself. For example, when considering the use of one of two treatments, a clinician may use one in more severely affected patients than the other. This commonly occurs in observational studies because they are not randomised. Another common type of selection bias is attrition bias. Attrition in a study is the loss of participants during the study. When participants are lost, it may not be known if they continued or discontinued the intervention. And there may be no data on outcomes. If there are systematic differences between people who leave the study and those who continue, attrition bias can be introduced. Propensity score methods are an increasingly popular statistical approach for real-world evidence to mimic randomization and minimize indication bias. Data from non-randomized populations are commonly adjusted using a variety of statistical methodologies that generate propensity scores. The propensity score is the probability for an individual to be assigned to a treatment given a set of observed characteristics. In a randomised study, each individual has a constant propensity score. This is not the case in clinical practice. For example, in a one-to-one -one treatment allocation scheme, such as a randomised control trial, the probability of an individual to be assigned to treatment A or B is always 0.5. The essence of propensity score methods is to generate a single propensity score between 0 and 1 for every individual patient in an analysis. That number indicates the probability that a patient receives one of the two treatments to be compared. Propensity score calculation involves grouping a treatment cohort to one or more comparator cohorts on the basis of similar patient, disease and paraclinical factors at baseline. The propensity score is calculated for each patient using a multivariate model, typically a logistic regression, in which treatment assignment is the dependent variable defined as the function of the baseline characteristics, which are the independent variables. The propensity score can be used to create match cohorts 
or to adjust the comparison of the primary outcome between treatment arms. After propensity scores have been generated for each individual in a cohort, we can use them to consider the comparability of the groups. In a randomised control trial, the strict inclusion and exclusion criteria will correct for all known confounders. The baseline characteristics of the two groups will have no significant differences. The probability of an individual being assigned to either treatment A or treatment B is always 0.5. In real-world observational studies, this is not the case. The baseline characteristics of groups receiving treatment A or treatment B can be significantly different. We can use propensity scores to match pairs from both treatment arms. Individuals that are unmatched are excluded from the analysis. It is possible that individuals from each group cannot be matched. In this case, it is not possible to compare these treatments. Once propensity scores have been calculated, a variety of methodologies can be used to ensure that the final characteristics of the groups to be compared are similar. The most common ones are propensity score matching and inverse probability of treatment weighting. With propensity score matching, the propensity score is used to create matched cohorts. It mimics randomization by matching sets of patients in treatment groups who have similar propensity scores. It disregards unmatched patients. Only matched sets of patients will be compared. The treatment effect is then estimated by directly comparing outcomes between matched treatment groups. With inverse probability of treatment weighting, the propensity score is used to adjust the comparison between treatment groups. It mimics randomization by assigning weights to patients based on propensity score. A patient's weight is a function of the propensity score. This method allows for analysis of the full sample. All patients will be included in the comparison, but with a different weighting. The treatment effect is estimated by comparing appropriately weighted treatment groups. This is an example how one-to-one -one propensity score matching works. We begin by calculating and assigning propensity scores to every individual in the two groups to be compared. In this case, those patients receiving either drug A or drug B. You will notice the differing numbers in each group. The next step of the process is to match the individuals from the two cohorts of interest using their propensity scores. There are a variety of statistical approaches to do this, but the most important objective is to generate a population of match pairs for analysis as shown here in the centre of the slide. Each pair should have a closely matched propensity score. The matched population depends on the baseline characteristics of the starting cohorts. As you can see on the slide, there are a number of unmatched individuals in Group A and Group B. This illustrates that pairwise matching is selective. The numbers of matched patients taken forward for analysis is less than we started with. After the matching process, it will be possible to make a comparison of the treatment effects of drug A versus drug B. Analysis will be conducted only on the matched pairs. The matched cohort to be analysed should have the same distribution of propensity scores. In the same way that a randomised control trial tabulates the key baseline characteristics of the randomised patient population, it is also possible to look at the baseline characteristics of the matched pairs to provide context for the results that follow. It is also important to notice some of the key features of this analytical technique. Firstly, a selection step has taken place through matching and we are now working on fewer patients than we started with. Secondly, the analysis of treatment effect associated with drug A versus drug B is specific to the cohort that have been matched here. A common way to assess indication bias reduction is by checking the baseline characteristics pre and post propensity score matching. Standardised difference or standardised difference percent is used to assess how well the propensity matching achieved balance between treatment groups. The standardised difference is calculated as the difference between the two treatment groups divided by the pooled standard deviation of the difference. A value of D less than 0.1 indicates that the groups are closely matched. 
with similar characteristics and that the comparison will be robust. The standardised difference percent expresses this as a percentage. A value of less than 10% indicates that the groups are closely matched. This is an example of propensity score matching. This study was investigating cases with relapsing remitting MS on a beta interferon or glatiramer acetate who had a clinical relapse. One group was changed to natalizumab, the other changed to a different beta interferon or glatiramer acetate. You will notice the large numbers in each group. If we look at the standardised different percents in this table, there are significant differences in a number of baseline characteristics between the two groups. This is evidence of indication bias. These groups should not be compared. The individuals in each group are given propensity scores on these confounding factors. Match pairs are identified. The number of match pairs taken forward in the analysis is lower than the number that were treated in each group. You will notice from the standard difference percents that there are now no significant differences in these baseline clinical characteristics of the two groups. Propensity score matching has taken two heterogeneous groups and resulted in groups with similar baseline characteristics. Clinical outcomes from these groups can now be compared. Real-world evidence can provide high-quality, clinically relevant information which can complement evidence from randomised control trials. However, it is important to be aware of and minimise potential bias, particularly indication bias, when using real-world data. Statistical methods have been developed that aim to adjust for multiple types of bias. Indication bias, for example, can be reduced using the propensity score. Propensity score matching uses the propensity score to match pairs in treatment arms for comparison. The matched cohort to be analysed should have the same distribution of propensity scores. Comparing the baseline characteristics pre and post matching can be useful to confirm that indication bias is minimised. The following checklist allows us to assess the quality and or robustness of a comparative study. Some of the important topics that should be reported in a comparative effective study are a description of the study target population and their baseline characteristics, an assessment of the sample size to check the adequacy of the study powering, specification of the propensity score model approach. The report should also formally test whether the propensity score model reduced the indication bias. It should also discuss the excluded or unmatched subjects particularly in the case of propensity score matching. There should be a description of the methodology used to control for attrition bias, for example, censoring. There should be a sensitivity analysis for unmeasured residual bias. And there should also be attempts to assess other biases. The more we minimise bias from the messy real world, the more credible the comparison that follows. Thank you very much for your attention.